suppose this is a little bit of a shift now in terms of what we've been listening to so far in the fact that, you know, we're, we're going away from talking about hesitancies in community and about the providers actually, you know, not wanting to um, recommend vaccines, but actually now actually looking at whether or not the providers themselves are actually receiving the vaccine. And this is really an issue that actually doesn't get a lot of airplay nationally back home in Australia, um, but also internationally. So I have got some conflicts that I want to um, just mention that I have received vaccine uh, money from vaccine manufacturers for investigator driven research, um, education grants and travel costs. I just wanted to put that out there. If you pick up any journal paper, and there are thousands out there that have looked at the issue of healthcare worker vaccination, whether that be of hospital-based vaccination, GP, primary care vaccination, you will look at the first paragraph and see the author nominate a numerous amount of reasons why we promote vaccination, especially in the hospital setting. They will talk about wanting to prevent outbreaks, reduce um, the spread to vulnerable patients, talk about the fact that we need to protect the staff member themselves and their family members, um, and also from a systems point of view, the fact that we want to reduce staff absenteeism, um, decrease expenditure, of course, um, and generally improve patient safety. We've all heard those messages. They're not new. What I think we forget about, however, is this nuance is that if we improve the uptake amongst the providers themselves, it means that they are more likely to talk about immunisation. They are more likely to promote immunisation. And that means in whatever setting is that we're getting better uptake amongst those groups who are most vulnerable. And I've put some of the pictures here, awful stock photos, I apologise profusely, but they represent the groups that we want to get vaccinated. Here in Australia, of course, we have Indigenous populations we're trying to target. Big group around, of course, are pregnant women, but those in the community that are vulnerable for other reasons because of underlying health conditions. So this is what we need to, to remember. And this is why I go in every day to try and see what we can do about actually getting uptake amongst our staff. So the simple answer is let's just get our healthcare workers vaccinated. And unfortunately, just like other populations that we've been talking about today so far, they're not an easy group to get on board. And there have been lots of studies, as I mentioned, that have looked at the knowledges, attitudes and practices of staff in a range of different healthcare settings. Um, and the, the work done by Hoffman et al, you know, really kind of summed up then the kind of the classic issues, the barriers that are impacting. Now I'm going to focus predominantly on flu vaccination. Even though healthcare workers are recommended for a range of different vaccines, we know that from the work done to date, that mainly they are pretty good at getting those other vaccines or showing evidence for those other vaccines, but they really suck when it comes to flu. So what's happening? We have access issues. Now, we have got major access issues when we talk about low and middle income countries. Let's not get this wrong. That is the number one reason why people are not getting vaccine in, in countries like Vietnam, where I did a survey, where only 2% of healthcare workers are getting vaccinated. But we've also got a range of other reasons, common issues that you will see in the community, the fear of adverse events, those misconceptions about the vaccine, um, doubts about their actual risk from the, from the flu, the usefulness of the vaccine, those doubts about whether or not there is actual need if, you, if the strains haven't changed each season, do I still need that vaccine? You know, doubting that flu is actually a, a, a serious disease. And classically, we still actually have some healthcare workers who are actually just af afraid of getting the vaccine itself. But what about on the flip side? What do we know about the factors that actually promote vaccination in these groups? Well, we know that in these settings, the number one factor why staff members will get a flu vaccine is because they want to protect themselves. That, that second reason, of course, 
thankfully all that comes through is that that need to protect their patients and at the same time also their family members. We know that if we get free, if we get access to a free vaccine, we're going to drive up uptake. Um, we also know that if we if it becomes a routine practice that if the staff member goes in year in, year out, that they will get vaccinated also. A little bit of peer pressure in this space doesn't go too, too bad. We know that if we have middle managers that are on board and are driving uptake, that they will get their colleagues down to that clinic, down to that mass clinic to get their vaccine. If we get vaccine on site, we're also doing really well because we will be able to mop up those people who maybe for one reason or another can't leave their ward or department to go and get vaccinated. And lastly, of course, if we introduce this thing down the bottom that will not be named, we'll of course get really good uptake, but that's a story for another day. So what do we know about these healthcare workers? Well, as I said, there have been a lot of studies looking at the facilitators, looking at the barriers around uptake. And in recent years, actually, we've, we've been coming, you know, into a space where we're actually trying to drill down even deeper to look at the factors impacting. And not just impacting within one country, but now looking across countries. So I wanted to bring up the work that was done by Gail and colleagues here, um, which has probably been promoted... Um, already presented at one of these meetings, um, but will be coming out in that vaccine issue that was spoken about before. You know, and this study is quite interesting that they looked across six different European countries and they looked at what made up an engaged healthcare worker in this space. But what were the factors then that were amongst a hesitant healthcare worker? And they know that from this study they found that those who were engaged, and sorry for my acronym there for those who don't know, healthcare worker HCW, um, that amongst those that are engaged, we're going to find, see a strong sense that the flu vaccine is really important to them. That they believe that it's going to have some sort of impact, not maybe just on themselves, but within their community of practice. They're going to have the knowledge, so they're going to believe that they have that knowledge about the rationale for vaccination, about actually how to go about getting vaccinated. And they still believe that they have that strong sense of autonomy. Nobody is out there actually going and, you know, giving them a big stick and telling them to go down to get vaccinated, that there is actually still their decision in this space to go and receive it. I was very lucky this year to actually get my hands on some data, which has very kindly been given to me from Angus, which is the same survey that was previously used um, in this study by George Cassianos. I actually got the chance to look at the data from um, Asia and Pacific. And so this was from nine countries, including Australia, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, Taiwan and Singapore. And what's really useful here is that there is so little data coming out from these countries in terms of vaccine uptake amongst healthcare workers. So I felt very privileged to get this. And this data spreads across paediatricians, GPs, um, and also hospital-based healthcare workers. Um, and so I took a slightly different approach in this setting. Um, I went down the space of actually applying the protective motivation theory um, into this space. And I know that's received a little bit of controversy in the past about whether or not there's, um, whether it's a valid tool or whether it's relative still nowadays. But, you know, this Asian setting is quite unique um, compared to Australia and myself, but, but also compared to Europe, is that, you know, a lot of these countries have actually had ongoing threats from avian influenza. Most of these countries, while these healthcare workers may have moved on, may have also been affected by SARS. So they're a very different space in terms of potentially their risk perceptions, their exposure to messages around flu. So I took a different approach and I applied the PMT theory and came up with some interesting um, findings. <laughs> this isn't published yet. Um, and so we found that, of course, 
not surprisingly, susceptibility and severity really were the underlying factors associated with their, 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 their need and their wants around the flu vaccine. Not so much in terms of efficacy and response cost here didn't really play a big part. And I'm not surprising because most of those countries will not have free vaccine for healthcare workers. So this is one of the biggest issues in this space. So what does this all mean and how can we use this? I'm very much a pragmatist. I, um, I, I work a lot with the people who are on the ground actually delivering flu vaccine ca um, campaigns into hospitals. So I need to ground this into some reality about how can I use all of that data to actually inform our next year's approach. What can we do differently? So I was having a think and, and, and coming to this, this conference, to this workshop around hesitancy, I couldn't help myself. I've been wanting to do this for years and I thought this was probably the right time to do it. I actually have applied and very kindly adapted without permission Julie Leask's um, hesitancy scale here. Again, this is not a published piece of work. This is me dabbling right now and I'm very open to some collaborations around and trying to get this from a dabble to actually a study and published. But I actually took the, the work that Julie's done in terms of looking at hesitancy in a community setting and actually trying to map out on that spectrum where everybody sits. I wanted to take this into the healthcare setting and start to think about, well, across that spectrum, where do our healthcare workers fall? At the top, and if those who have worked in the healthcare setting, you will know this well, we have those who work in infectious diseases or work in respiratory wards. They are the ones who are going to be out there, first ones in the queue, lining up, probably will be doing a bit of a photo opportunity, will probably get the hospital exec on board. There generally could be some of our older staff members. These are the groups that are out there advocating. They're the ones spreading the message. In a drop down, we have the bulk of where our healthcare workers sit. And, I, and I'm being a little bit jokey here, but I'm not trying to dismiss in any way this tool. But this is actually how I, I group this, this lot. Is that they've gone to get the free, vac the free lollipop. They want a free vaccine, but they definitely want the free lollipop. They want some time out of the wards. It's a social event every year to actually get out of the ward, go and see a colleague, have a, have a chat en route down to the mass clinic and get their vaccine. They don't think about it. They don't need any prods. They just do it every year. So that's great. We've got those guys down pat. We don't need to worry about them. We have this group in the middle. And this is where it starts to become a little bit trickier. We've got a group that are just a tad too busy to get out of their ward or department. Generally could be surgeons. Um, and look, you know, they will have received it in the past. They won't make it a routine. But if someone comes to them, they won't say no. They'll sit there at their desk typing away. Someone will roll up their sleeve and jab them. And it's done. No real issue, but they won't come to you. This is where we've got things getting a little bit trickier. We've got these two groups, the never had the flu, I'm fit and healthy. I'm not 100% sure I believe the evidence about the flu vaccine or I've heard someone tell me that you can actually catch the flu from the vaccine. And these are the statements that you hear. I'm sure for many of you, you've heard a colleague say this or you've read something like this in the paper. These are the actual things that are said to me. They will talk about avoidance behaviours and will put a lot of emphasis on, well, I can just pick someone who's got the flu and I will just avoid them. Or I will do extra hand hygiene during winter and I'm fine. I don't need that vaccine. I've never had the flu. So how are we going to engage those healthcare workers? What are we going to do? We have, of course, our models and we can apply these models. We can apply the traditional space or I've actually picked up this empowerment space. I quite like the use of empowerment but never say the word empowerment to a healthcare worker. They actually hate that word. Never say it to them. They don't understand it and they don't like it. But what can we do about empowerment? 
Before we go forward, we need to understand our community of practice. Just like you do in your communities, whether they be for childhood immunisation, it's no different. You must understand that healthcare setting that you're going into. This is my local healthcare setting that I do a lot of work with. A local big hospital that's in Sydney that I know have very limited resources. They don't generally put on that many extra staff each season to run campaigns. We've just gone into a space of having a mandatory policy for healthcare workers who fall into particular at-risk care areas. Um, we don't have any KPIs in immunisation in Australia generally. Um, this hospital runs mass clinics, does a bit of mobile trolleys, but has no real peer-to-peer -peer vaccination. Um, most of the staff involved with the staff vaccination clinic are also running a lot of OHS programs. They're doing the hand hygiene, they're doing the needle stick injuries, they're doing all of those other programs. Support for management is very varied, which then affects communication. I know in this particular setting that these um, staff are only allowed to put up posters on particular wards at particular times and then they have to take them down. And that is it. There is no ongoing communication about the need for vaccination, which means that they rely very much on the communication material that comes from drug companies. But when you, when you look at the communication material, it's mainly to do with where is the mass clinic. There is nothing being said about the rationale for vaccination. Which leads me to my first point. What do we need to do? We need to rethink how we educate staff. We're not doing it very well at the moment. We overestimate their knowledge levels. We, we, we emphasise too much on kind of the delivery of the vaccine, how they can access it, without thinking about the issues that these healthcare workers are actually talking about. And this year, they were talking about timing. Were we vaccinating too early? What are we doing when there's no strange change? And what are we doing about this high dose versus low dose or standard dose vaccination? We're not talking about these things to our healthcare workers and so they are confused. And so then they're not having those conversations with their patients because they do not understand it. If we do give information, we are generally dumbing it down and this is a major problem. Is there a role for some different approaches to education? Could we be doing something around motivational interviewing, decision aids or using other tools? We're not trying these at the moment. And at the moment, we don't think about the whole population in our hospitals. We do very little when it comes to populations that come from other ethnic, ethnic groups. The next thing we need to do is rethink communication. We need to remember what is that number one factor that healthcare workers think about when they think about the flu vaccine, it's themselves. We need to move away from this space, you know, this, this protective space, to thinking now about what are the messages that are going to have some more impact. And these are messages from actually um, a Sydney-based um, local health district. What new messages can we use? And I often tell people, why don't you tell them about the fact that you can be asymptomatic for flu and still shedding? And healthcare workers are like, oh, can you? I didn't know that. There's a lot of different things that we could be using. We could be using, we could be drawing back on the evidence about the fact that we know healthcare workers acquire flu at higher rates than the general public. That would be a surprise to most healthcare workers. We've got to remember also our healthcare workforce is made up of a range of people. A lot of them will have underlying health conditions. A large proportion of them will also be pregnant at one time. Let's use these kind of um, factors to build into our messaging. And mostly we need to revisit our approach to immunisation. We oversell the flu vaccine massively in everything, in the papers we write, in the statements that we make about it. Let's get real. We, they, our healthcare workers, know that vaccine efficacy is not as great as some of the other vaccines. So let's be truthful about it. But in that flip side, let's keep reminding them that washing their hands is not going to do it. So we need to balance out those messages. I'm a big believer of the diffusion of innovation approach. I think that we use a top-down 
higher management to try and promote our vaccination and we should be going in at middle management or below. We've got a lot of diffusers in our hospital settings. Let's use them. Let's get to them and get them trained to get those messages pushed out. I also think we need to be doing a little bit more around peer promotion and also doing a lot more around peer delivery, but I've heard there's a lot more barriers I've got to get around to get that going. Patients as advocates, that's a really interesting space and nothing's been done around that. I don't like inducements, especially because I know in the hospital setting they're not sustainable. You start a raffle and you take it away next the following year, you're going to lose rapport with your staff and they're not going to be coming to your mass clinic the following year. So our strategies need to be all of hospital and we need to build on the momentum of seasons. How can we draw on that season that we've just gone through to build into that next program? So these are my concluding slides. And actually, to be truthful, I really kind of only just wrote these this morning because I still am feeling a bit of a, you know, conundrum about whether or not I 100% believe that we are in a space, you know, in the right space around all of this um, and whether we're going down the right path. So I've said access, of course, is a major issue. We need to be doing something about that right now. I don't think we make it take enough time to understand our system and our staff. I also think we may as well get rid of social media in this space because that's been shown not to work. Let's not go down that path. Staff delete emails like they're going out of fashion. Don't bother sending a staff member an email. What we're really lacking at the moment is a good database. And if we don't have a good database, we can't find those pockets within our systems where we've got vaccine hesitant staff members who year in, year out are not getting a vaccine. We cannot right now find them. And this is one thing that I'd love to talk to more people about and get some traction going, is train the trainer. In most hospitals that I know back in Australia, Vaccine programs are delivered by people who've been in the system for a long time. They are nurses who have gone through their nursing, they've moved out of that space and they're now responsible for staff health. So they are a voice that have been there for a long time but they are a voice that have been lost. And they are also a voice that has received no training in how to communicate with a very senior doctor who doesn't necessarily agree the flu vaccine is necessary. So what are we going to do with those staff? Thank you.